We're going to just keep pushing the envelope thinking, this is easy, we can do this, until one day we're going to just, it's going to explode in our faces. <laughs> yeah, that might, that might be the case, and that might be very soon. But I, I realized just today that this is episode number five, which yeah. means that we are halfway towards our experimental limit of 10 episodes. So we're 50% of the way through this at this stage. We're getting a lot of... Uh comments and questions about what happens beyond 10. Oh, you can't have I missed these comments. Yes, I, I have. I've definitely seen them. Uh, I'm still not 100% sure that we will make it to 10. Um, <laughs> You're worried I'm going to go overseas again and eat some poor food and keel over, aren't you? Yes, that, that's partly true. I, I am slightly worried that you will die from some travel adventure. And I'm also mainly worried that we will just run out of things to talk about you know maybe like we'll make it to eight episodes and then we'll think ooh, what le- what else to talk about um yeah. so that that's that's part of the reason why we have this 10 episode uh number is to see if we can even make it that far like that awkward silence on a date or something when you get to that point where you realize i have nothing left to say yes follow up from last time or follow up from what's come before what, yes. anything on anything you want to talk about uh okay uh, so we got a whole bunch of Comments and we we solicited comments last in last episode uh, on a few things. But before I forget, I wanted to mention that I was very happy to see that a couple of people found out the kind of little secret of our intro. It's not a song, but our intro sound that plays right at the beginning. I'm not going to say what it is, yeah. But I will just say that there is there is something interesting to be found out about that intro sound if you are paying attention. And I have seen some commenters figure it out, and well done to those commenters. I'm very pleased. I wasn't sure if anyone would ever notice, uh, but a couple people did, so that made me very happy. That was an Alan production, wasn't it? Did, was it Alan that made that one? Yes, Alan made that one. Uh, Alan Stewart, who has the YouTube channel, and he does a bunch of uh, the music for your videos in particular, doesn't he? He does. The guy, the guy's a genius. Alan Stewart. He's, yeah, Alan Key eighty six is his channel, but uh-huh. he um, he's really good at making making that music. Like really good on the piano, especially. I really like his piano stuff. So. Because he did that, uh, the Yule Log one for you, right? The the chemistry Yule Log? He did. He did. It was, that was, like, the thing, the thing I love about working with Alan is, like, in this kind of, in this youtube world, you know, there's only so many things we can do. And we often ask for help, don't we, from mm-hmm. animators and musicians and people. And it's so brilliant that, that so brilliant that how much they help us, you know, mm-hmm. these, these volunteers. But the, the thing is, because they're volunteers and everyone in the world's busy, they do things on their own, own time scale. Alan's so quick is the thing that amazes me. There have been times where I've been, like, filming in a cemetery and I've sent him, like, an email or a text from in the cemetery going, oh, I could really use this piece of music that kind of creates the atmosphere of me walking around a cemetery. And before I get back to, like, my house or my hotel, he's, like, played it and recorded it and emailed mm-hmm. it to me and it's brilliant. You know, mm-hmm. He's a... He's a He's great like that. And yeah, yeah the, the Yule Log was brilliant as well. As, as you said, he, I made this hour-long film, which I won't recommend people watch because it's an hour long. But, but, um, but it needed music. And he, he watched like a rough cut of the video and just played the music live to it. Like he, he just watched it and reacted to what he was seeing on the screen and scored this hour-long video just like off the cuff. And if you do watch it, that is the only re- that is the best reason to watch it. Just to just to see, just to watch it. Think, <laughs> this, this guy is playing like this guy is just watching this for the first time and making the music. It's, it's astounding to me. You're totally underselling your own video. I'm I'm going to put it in the show notes and recommend that people Go watch on. it yeah, because okay. it is it is I'll just it is the most different kind of Yule log you will ever see, and it is interesting to see uh, for that reason. Uh, but yeah, the the his music that goes along with it is quite good. So he's great. He's great, yeah. Alan. Thanks, right. thanks to Alan for uh, putting together our intro sound, which I quite like. And uh, I went through a very large number of, of different sounds and eventually selected that one. And I think I think it's working pretty well as the opening. So I mean, he very created happy with he, it. Cre- he created loads on his own, Alan, didn't he? He sent yeah. you a whole bunch. Yeah, so. yeah. You're very fussy. <laughs> I am very fussy. And it turns out that finding uh, good sounds is surprisingly is surprisingly hard to yeah. do. Um, so, so anyway, I was very happy to see that some people found the little secret uh, in that intro sound that we have. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and the, it is there for other people to try and figure out. Excellent. Um, second thing I have on my list here is that we did do uh, or I did a call for 
reviews from different countries around the world if we can get them in the iTunes store. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to see that we got four new countries that have left reviews in the iTunes stores, and uh, that's Guatemala, Israel, Japan, and Norway. So thanks to the listeners in those places who have left been, the reviews. Have, have you been to any of those places at? I have been. I have been to fifty percent of those places. Where have you been? I have been to Japan, and yes. I have been to Norway. Right. Uh, and I have to say that I liked. I liked both of those trips for very different reasons. Japan is. Oh, I really. I went to uh, Tokyo, and uh, that just incredibly, unbelievably dense city. Uh, and then Norway is basically the opposite, right? It's just nature in every direction, and absolutely astounding nature in every direction. So, uh, yeah, I've been to two of those places. Have you any any of those places? Uh, I have been to two as well. I mm -hmm. have been also been to Japan. I've been to Japan a few times actually. It's a it's a bit of a favorite. Mm -hmm. And I have been to Israel. Mm -hmm. So, and Israel is, uh, gosh, that's an amazing place. If you like your history, you got to get. That's a good place. I was going to say right because you have been there for Bible decks. Bible is that decks, the channel? Yes. yes, my. You just basically, I realise, <laughs> like you bring up all my channels, mm -hmm. like pretending to be nice, but really you're just mocking me for having so many channels. I, I am not mocking. I am envious. Okay, I did go. I did film in Israel for Bible decks and. Uh, it was. It's an amazing place. Amazing. What was? What was? Okay, so you told me once about the the little ladder in. Uh, in was that in Israel? Oh yes, that is. That's in Jerusalem. That's at the. Uh, I think it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or something like that. I think it's called. It's like I. I had never actually heard of it, and it's like the most important church in Christianity, and it's mm -hmm. in Jerusalem, and because it's this really important place where. It's the church is supposedly built over the site of the crucifixion and the um, the burial of Christ's body. I mean, we're not going to go into that, but anyway, mm -hmm. this is supposedly where the church is is built. Uh, so it's really important to all these different denominations of Christianity. So they all have different parts of it, like the Greek Orthodox Christians might have that alcove over there, and that little. That little section of the church there belongs to these people, and it's a real little. Sometimes it can be a real little turf war, it seems. Mm -hmm. And very famously, there's this ladder, and if you look it up on Wikipedia and everywhere, you you, you can read all about it. It's like it's really famous. Mm -hmm. There was this ladder, just a small like workman's ladder, put outside, sort of on a roof near a window. I don't know what for. Maybe someone was doing some painting or something. And then there was this big dispute about. I don't know whether it should be there or whose it was. I, I can't remember the details, mm -hmm. but it got to the point where no one could move or touch the ladder, mm -hmm. and it's it's been there ever since. Mm -hmm. So so you go there and it looks like there's this some workman has left his ladder there, but it's been there for tens and tens of years, and it's got mm -hmm. all these interesting stories behind it, and someone once moved it, and there was all this controversy and. Um, but it's it's a great I mean it's a great example of you know tensions you can get within religion I guess but, mm -hmm. but I don't think we should turn this into a uh, religious podcast because <laughs> I'm definitely not going into the comments there. Yeah, uh, no, the the comments the comments will be uh, delicate might be the best way to put it. Um, but yeah, I remember I remember that was interesting just that that no one had touched it and that was uh, I saw that on one of your Bible Dex videos I think. The um, the comments could not be more delicate. Than the storm that we have created with this talk about infringement. Yes, yes, I was, I was going to, uh, I was going to uh, move to that next, which is uh, you. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you uh, appreciate my phrasing of it, but you wanted a different word than infringing to describe when, when something like a, a newspaper rehosts one of our videos and puts their own ads on it. Uh, and earns money off of it. That you you didn't like the word infringing to describe this activity because you thought that it was like a wimpy word, and you wanted something meaner. Is that is that fair? Well, meaner is not the word I would use. Let's mm -hmm. make one thing clear from the start. Uh -huh. This all started uh -huh. because of you. Yes. And you calling it stealing. That is exactly right. And I I think that was a Freudian slip. What, what well? <laughs> and I think you, and I think you have secretly. Your subconscious has nailed your true colours to the mast, and now your intellect is taking over, and you're being all technical and legal. Well, I, I adequately explained this. <laughs> this is 
this is the danger of the podcast is is casually saying things that upon reflection you think that is not that is not where I, what I what my actual position is and the infringing stealing thing I feel very strongly about it. So yes, you are correct that I, I was inaccurate in my first descriptions, uh, but I'm I, I think that is that is a side issue. You okay. are looking for a different word. Let um, me let me let me say a few other things. Yeah. I intellectually understand the difference <laughs> between going up and punching some grandmother in the face and taking her handbag and stealing one of CG Progress videos mm-hmm. and putting it on my... Look, I called it stealing. Mm-hmm. Taking one of CG Progress videos and putting it on my own website. I understand the difference. Mm-hmm. And there can be a difference of severity... Mm-hmm. The difference of severity can actually go the other way. I mean, I think what a big tabloid newspaper does to us is probably worse than um, what some, you know, starving child might do if they steal a loaf of bread. Mm-hmm. And yet one of them is labelled a thief and the other one has merely infringed on copyright. Mm-hmm. But I think, and I don't really care about this that much and I can't <laughs> believe we're talking about it again. But you did tell me, I mean, I said to you, we can't talk about this again, Grant. You said, no, no, that's okay. Podcasts, you know, that's what podcasts are about. Yeah, it's, it's, of... a, it's, a, it's an evolving conversation. Yeah. So that's why <laughs> we, will, we will keep on this. So, so here we go again. Mm-hmm. I have been reading people's comments. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed them very much. Mm-hmm. I've enjoyed some of their suggestions. Uh, I have understood their arguments. Mm-hmm. I, I think I've understood their arguments. But when you do look up, you know, dictionary definitions of infringing, you see words like encroaching and undermining and contravening. And I think these are these are soft words. These are words that are cushioning cushioning the blow or obscuring the severity. I mm-hmm. still think that. But maybe it's just me. And I know this is semantics anyway. And maybe I've just always misunderstood the word infringing. Mm-hmm. But I just think it's a soft word and it makes something bad sound not as bad. But anyway, I'm saying, so anyway, people have been coming up with all these words and ideas, you know. Mm-hmm. I think they're just humouring me. I think they all think I'm an idiot and they're just humouring me by coming up with these words. It's, no. It's, it's obvious everyone agrees with you. But no, was- no. I, I, well, I, I, I think people, uh, reading through the comments, I think the general consensus was that I, I am, I think I would, I would say it's fair that most people agree that there should be a, a, a distinction. But there were a fair number of, of people who... Uh, did like this idea of trying to come up with some different word that infringing is not the best word for this situation. All right, I've um, got a word. I've got a word. Oh, yeah? You have I'm a word? Gonna, I'm going to throw one into the mix. Okay. And it's not perfect, but uh-huh. I want to be part of the debate. Uh huh. How about this one? Freebooting. Freebooting? Freebooting. Because basically it was inspired by a few people were saying different mm. things and you told me about piracy. Mm-hmm. So I went, I went and looked up words associated with piracy and I came along, I came across this word freebooting, which is to do with piracy and looting and taking things. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I like that it's got the word free in it because they're taking things and, you know, taking things without paying. And I like mm-hmm. that it's got booting in it because it's, it's got, that makes it sound a bit computery. But I also like that it's got this history of piracy and a cowboy activity. So I'm, I'm going to put freebooting out there. I've got to say, it is, I, thought, I assumed that this was a word that you had just made up. Um, no. Free, look it up. Yeah, this is what I'm doing right now. So freebooting. Uh, look at that. Okay, let's go to the, the Wiktionary, see what it has to say about that. Mm-hmm. So freebooter is a type of pirate. Mm-hmm. And freebooting is engaged in piracy or plunder. Oh, those freebooters taking our videos. <laughs> 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 I'm sick of it. Free, you know, this freebooting, it's a serious issue. We need to do something about these freebooting, <laughs> these freebooters. You sound so sincere. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I feel ridiculous that we're still talking about this, but anyway. Oh, no, no, it's not ridiculous. Podcasts, podcasts can go on forever about these kinds of things. Um, <laughs> it's funny because the reason you like it is I think the reason I, I don't like it, which is the free part in the beginning. Yeah. Because yeah. that that can that can be that can be both ways. Um, That's a fair criticism. Uh, but but it is interesting that you found a word that is related related to piracy, 
which is sort of related to infringement. You know, obviously, I know it's not the same thing, people, um, but it's in the same <laughs> it's in the same world of acts. Yeah. I like the booting is at the the booting is at strong point. Mm. The, the free mm. is the weakness. The free does make it does again soften the blow a bit. So hmm. like freestyle, or, you know, makes it sound a bit fun and nice. You know, hmm. Hmm. Uh, anyway. so free booting. It's interesting to think about. I, I was I was just looking at through some of the alternatives, and uh, yeah, they, they all have problems. And I didn't see anyone come up with that. Um, where was the one? Yeah, there were there were a few that I thought might might not be bad, but uh, freebooting is a genuinely new one that is coming, or not new, but it's it's old enough that it is new, and so it is coming without any kind of baggage. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. Interesting. All right. I'll put it out there. Thanks well, for uh, thanks for humoring me. And now I'm we... sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Because we're we'll... not talking about this in the next podcast. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't understand, right? Because in in the comment section for this podcast, we will have to see what people think about the freebooting term, <laughs> and maybe there'll be more to discuss in a future episode. One never knows. Is there any chance you're going to put freebooting like in the title of the podcast? I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to I have to think of a I have to think of a title. Um, coming up with the titles is is the tricky part, but freebooting. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. It might make it. It might make it. I'm people, just... people listening now will already know because we don't know. We're recording this live from our perspective, but you, dear listener, are in the future from us and already know probably what the title is, even as you're listening right now. Which is one of the strange things about podcasting. So, we will see if I have used the word freebooting in the title or not. Excellent. Anyway, any more follow up? Uh, I have nothing on my list uh, other than uh, other than those few items. Um, Speaking of freebooting, oh, by the way. Sorry, actually. Uh, yeah, go on. I do. Or do you, actually, do you want to tell me the freebooting yeah. thing first? Go S- on. Speaking of freebooting, by the way, mm-hmm. I noticed someone freebooted one of our podcasts and put it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. See, so if I keep using it in this context, uh-huh. eventually it's going to be adopted. <laughs> right. Somebody free, freebooted our podcast, or they freebooted a clip of our podcast and put it on, on YouTube. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which, which was kind of funny, uh, since I think that was one that was the one we were talking about copyright. I don't remember exactly, but uh, no, uh, <laughs> very very meta. Those freebooters, they have a sense of humor. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about this, but it's funny to hear you say. Um. <laughs> what do you got? What else? Anything else you want to follow up? Is well, that it for follow up? Is it time to move on? Is it time to move on from the past and talk about the now? I think so. I think there is. We have cleared out the follow up uh, for this episode. Oh th- no! I no, we haven't. Oh, okay. I just want to thank the person who wrote in comments and referred to me as the white Morgan Freeman. <laughs> oh yeah, that's quite a compliment. I know because I mean, clearly, clearly, you have the broadcasting voice in this duo, and I am basically just a passenger. So t- to be referred to as the white Morgan Freeman was a was a special moment for me, and I will. Uh, I'll treasure that. Uh, that is at, that is very nice. As terribly misguided as it was. What have you been up to? Uh, as you know, I have been in the middle of moving flats, uh, which is part of the craziness we referred to in the previous episode. Uh, with, with life, everything always happens all at once. And so I was, uh, as of last week, I was I was trying to we, we we were launching this podcast. I had a video that was way overdue, and uh, my wife and I were flat hunting in London for various time sensitive reasons. Uh, and so everything happens at once, and that has been what has kind of been occupying uh, a lot of my time during the day. Is is uh, is that big project? Um, just what do you like? What do you like when you move house? Because you're kind of. I always think of you as this high tech guy, and you know you're very paperless. And uh, is there any is there anything? How do you utilize technology when you're moving house? Uh, I don't know if, how I utilize the technology, um, but I, I would say that I I enjoy moving uh, mainly because it is a great excuse to purge as many physical items from my life as I possibly can. <laughs> uh, and people people around me, sort of in the orbit of my life, know this that I am I am not a fan of physical objects. And uh, sometimes people want to give me gifts, you know, people in my life, they'll know it's my birthday or it's some event or some celebration. And I'm always trying to tell people the best gift that you can give me is nothing. I am genuinely like I will be happier to not receive a gift and and to then not have the burden of this object to take care of 
uh, or to have in my house at some place. Uh, and so I really work very hard to try to minimize the number of things that I have. Uh, but it is still – you always end up with just some stuff. It is, it is completely uh, unavoidable. And whenever you move, that is just the perfect opportunity to get rid of as many things as you possibly can. And so I feel like over the course of my life, there have been two trends with each move. I've sort of cut down and pared down my life to an even greater minimalism. And then, of course, over that time, as technology has increased, uh, there are fewer and fewer physical things that I actually need to begin with. Uh, and so I view my own life now as basically I have my clothes and I have my electronics and, and that is sort of the bulk of the things that are personally mine. And then there's always some miscellaneous that is around that, but I, I try to try to keep it as small as possible. Um, <laughs> I, 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 um, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what does your... What does your flat look like? Is it just all like white walls and empty shelves, or like do you like do you have pictures or? So, like... my you know my ideal place would be as empty and as Spartan as possible, you know. Um, but of course, you know you have to have stuff in your apartment. You know, there's couches and you need cutlery and there, there are these other items. Um, but I just I try to keep that at as much of a minimum as humanly possible. And every once in a while, I do go through all of my stuff and think, okay, what can I get rid of? And I get really excited about figuring out something that I don't have to have anymore. Uh, like but what's, what's something you've got rid of over the last couple of days as you prepare for this current move that excited you? Uh, I'm, I'm, okay, so actually one of the things that I, I've gotten – rid of uh, was some old work clothes that had somehow still been able to uh, live at the back of my closet unnoticed uh, from my teaching days. Uh, so I was very happy to get rid of those. So some uh, some jackets uh, and some ties that had somehow escaped my notice. Uh, so I was very pleased to get rid of those. Um, but I haven't done my proper purge yet uh, because uh, I've just been involved with other things. So tomorrow is actually going to be my big, big purge day. Uh, but I've just done a, done a little bit of things. Um, so as I look around my office at the moment, like mm -hmm. I have like this old globe of the moon and a teddy bear from my childhood and oh. uh, and a bunch of stones I've collected from oh. know, places around the world and oh god trophies and framed pictures oh, and so, uh, old cricket bats and an old fashioned telescope and every one of those things is like a horror to me hearing you describe that. What do they? What do they make you feel like? What's the emotion you feel at the thought of owning <laughs> trinkets? Ah, oh, trinkets! Even the word is so gross. Um, <laughs> I mean, just ah, oh, trinkets, right? I mean, it's just just worthless stuff that is taking up space. Uh, it's ah, oh, it's just awful. It's just what, awful. What do you want to use that space for, though? <laughs> like, if you have all this space that I don't have, how do you space, utilize it? Space is space is like freeing to the mind. So I do have to say I, I really enjoyed – we're, since we're in between flats, right, we have keys to both places uh, for the next week or so. Um, and we haven't yet moved everything into the new flat. And so the new flat is basically empty. And boy, is that just great, right? You have all this space and it just – it feels so freeing. I don't know. I, I feel like every object that is in my – sort of my visual sweep acts as like a, like a tiny burden – on the mind. And so this is why I really like to just empty out as much as humanly possible. Um, so that is that is my feeling towards trinkets. It's like they're they're all just a burden somehow. And uh they're just oh, the word, just the word trinket. Just ah, oh, it's gross. Memento, you don't like mementos? No, I have I have no mementos really. I mean, I mean obviously we have like pictures and things. I'm not a crazy person, right? But I have digital pictures. I don't pictures. know, I'm beginning to wonder, but <laughs> I have digital pictures, um, and you know when, when like when I go on on vacations and things, uh, my wife and I do what we call memory shots, where we're not necessarily trying to get a good picture, like oh look at this beautiful mountain or anything. We're just taking a picture so that we remember whatever it is in the future. You know when we get, when we look back through our photo album. Um, but the worst thing I could imagine is you know buying some like junky key ring of the Eiffel Tower to be like, oh, remember when we went to the Eiffel Tower, right? And now this thing just has to be there in your life forever, taking up space. It's just terrible. That's absolutely terrible. Um. <laughs> then how come uh -huh. when, we were, when we were at the Royal Society the other day and they pulled out 
Isaac Newton's draft of the Principia, mm -hmm. you wanted to hold it and have your photo taken with it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was great. It's Not great. that I'm comparing the original Principia <laughs> to an Eiffel Tower keyring, of course. No, of course. It is great that somebody else stores that, right? <laughs> I have my, my philosophy is not for museums, right? I love that museums exist. I love that there are archivists who keep track of all of this stuff. I just, I have no need to be some kind of archivist for my own life. That's just, ah, uh, it... But, who else is, but is, isn't that what your house is, you know, in a way? It's a little, it can be a little museum of you. Oh, that's so gross. No, it, the, no, the, the very thought of that seems just wrong to me. It, it, your your space, uh, your house, that your space is to be used in an optimal way, and it, it it's not like a. You would say museum, right? I would say like it's a mausoleum, right? Like like you are you are being buried and entombed with yeah. all of this stuff that you have collected over a lifetime, and so I, I feel very strongly about this. Um, but I, I will just say that that uh, my my wife has made the comment, which might not be untrue, uh, that. So do you know the TV show uh, Hoarders? I don't know if it's on in the UK or not. Um, I can imagine what it's about. And I have yeah. seen these you know, documentaries where someone's, you know. Yeah, buried, you've, buried. you've seen documentaries about hoarders, right? People who yeah. keep everything. Yeah. Uh, and my wife says, <laughs> again, might not be untrue, that I am basically like the opposite of a hoarder in, in that, right, hoarders have a hard time letting go of objects, obviously mm -hmm. too hard of a time letting go of objects. Uh, and and so she thinks that I am basically the reverse. I have too easy of a time letting go of objects, and that I'm just I am way too willing to just get rid of stuff. Um, so I, I I'm not necessarily arguing with her there. Is there a tension uh, here? Like does does she say, oh no, can I please keep that? As you sort of throw away her grandmother's no, no. engagement ring? No, no, I, I would never I would never throw away her stuff. Right? That's that's uh, that's not cool. This is mostly related to my own stuff and and uh there there is a flip side to this which is which is on the computer i keep way more stuff than is probably reasonable yeah. uh like i oh god i don't even want to know but i you know i probably have hundreds of thousands of digital files of some kind or another on my computer mm. uh but again i i don't mind about that at all because it just it doesn't matter right it doesn't take up any physical space i don't need to see it uh so that doesn't that doesn't bother me at all. But you're right. My my ideal office would be as empty as possible, sort of a desk and a laptop, and that would be just about it. In kind of, in my in my perfect office. I'm aware that this makes you sound like really cool, and I think people are gonna like hear this and go, "Oh, Gray's so cool. He's like functional, and he's the modern digital man, and everything." But just between you and me, yeah, you do realize this is unusual. This trait, this behavior you're exhibiting is highly unusual to be this extreme about objects. I, I, well, what I would say is that I have just, I have just thought it through. Uh, that like, what, what does this memento do for you that like a picture of the memento wouldn't also do? Um, and, and what, it, like, what are you going to do when you're, 10 years or 20 years older and you're looking at still carrying around 10 or 20 years worth of just stuff right that that, that i think that would be my perspective on it is i'm i'm, I'm trying to like look forward to you know what what what's going to happen here you're just going to keep accumulating things and so you have to just not we're, keep accumulating we're physical things. beings you know i mean we could have just taken photos of the moon but we wanted to go and step on it and touch it and <sighs> like we we are of this world you know we <laughs> I am not arguing that people shouldn't go to the moon. I am also arguing that when astronauts are on the moon, they should grab all the moon stuff they possibly can and bring it back. Just don't right? put it in your house. Right? Just, yeah, I don't want to keep it. Um, you know, but somebody should definitely keep that. That's what we have museums for. So that's that's kind of my thoughts on this. Um, but, yeah, I, I've... I, I do try to get rid of just as much stuff as I possibly can. And uh, li living in an absolutely tiny, tiny London flat uh, definitely brings that home in a way that, that uh, like, if I was living in America, it would not also be so uh, so apparent, like, the physical objects that you have in your life. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so. All right. <laughs> I'm looking forward to ditching all my stuff tomorrow. I am flying tomorrow. Yeah. So 
it's late at night and after this podcast I will start thinking about packing. Mm-hmm. Are you a late packer or are you someone who uh, gets it done nice and early? I have a checklist that I use every time for packing. No, really? Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> that might surprise you. Uh, yeah. But I, I, have a, I have a checklist. I mentioned it before. I use a program called OmniFocus. And I have a, a checklist that I can reactivate every time I'm about to pack that has an enormous list of things that are the potential things that I might need to bring with me. And so I use that. I usually pack the day before. Mm. Uh, but I, I have to say that I find the packing process very stressful uh, for, for no particular reason. I don't, I don't like it at all. But so well, you, It involves a whole bunch of physical objects. I guess so. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, I do not like packing. I, I find it, yeah, I find it uncomfortable and stressful and I still worry about forgetting stuff. But I'm th- what time are you leaving tomorrow? Because we're, we're recording this at like eight o'clock at night. I uh, actually, I'm leaving, um, I'm actually not till the afternoon. So I have got some, I have got some buffer, but I, I will always leave it to the last possible minute. And mm-hmm. how's that work out for you? Always badly. <laughs> um, and this is this has been a particularly unpleasant unpleasant one because I'm going away for quite a long time. I'm going away for like five weeks, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be working while I'm away, which is unusual for me to to be editing while I'm away. I know I know you do it a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got a new, a reasonably new laptop, mm-hmm. and I've just like this evening thought, oh, I'm going to need some bits of software and some things on here that I haven't really thought about, mm-hmm. and I've been trying to sort that out, forgetting how terrible I am with computers and the problems I have with software and uh, all sorts of things. And it's just turning into this nightmare and nothing works. And now I'm actually, you know, becoming a bit anxious about it all. So, and this is, this is aside from like any clothes and things that I'm going to need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of more worried about what hard drives am I going to need and which cables and what microphone and what lens and but the the software computer thing's been causing me the most problems. Well, that is because you have, a, speaking of physical objects, you have a mountain of tapes and hard drives that you work with for all of the uh, all of the video that you've captured. I do. I have gone tapeless now, but um, yeah, I have a lot of a lot of material. Yeah, a lot, lot, lot of material. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you have to manage which of those drives you're going to actually be bringing with you. I'm not taking the big drives with me. I'm just dragging over bits and pieces that I think I might need. The mm-hmm. bigger problem has been the new. Uh, Mac operating system mm-hmm. on, my, on my MacBook Pro, the Mavericks. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing, nothing works on it. So all this stuff, all these, all this software that I've paid a fortune for, nothing works. And, I'm, and I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to buy a whole bunch of new software, and God, I can't, <laughs> can't afford it. It's crazy. So and like, so I'm sitting here thinking, trying to make things work, and looking on the internet to find out if there's a way to make this old piece of software work on that, and. Mm-hmm. And I'm just really bad at that stuff anyway. People always think I must know a bit about computers because I work on them, but I, I don't. I'm rubbish. It's been a, I need you, basically. I need you to be here and mm-hmm. just, like, sit next to me for three or four hours and just sort me out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know it's too late for that, too. But. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to help you there. No, I know. Um, but so is is this podcast then basically, are you procrastinating with packing by talking yeah, to me but now? Don't, but don't feel bad because I would find some other way to procrastinate. As soon as we finish, I'll probably think, oh, I think I might just edit one more number file video. Before I go. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. That's, that's the sort of thing I'll do. And then at like 2 a.m. I'll think, all right, now I'm definitely going to pack. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you, ha- you did help me the other day, though, when I had to, I had to go on a whole bunch of flights and um, I forgot my headphones. And it's, it's funny that I forgot my headphones because... <laughs> Like you do have this kind of technology mentor role in my life now, <laughs> and you're kind of like my own personal sort of Siri that I that I say, oh, I need an app for this, or I need a, a gadget that will do this, and I just contact you and you tell me what to do. Yes, I, I have I have noticed this that you you have you are leaning on me for recommendations. Yeah, and in particular when we are physically together, if we both put our phones on the table. You just purchased the, you know, the, the iPhone case that I recommended. So we both have phones that look exactly the same. And that's really disconcerting, too, because you always think the other one's like grabbing your phone. And right. even though you intellectually know that's not the case, it's really, it makes you feel really anxious when you think someone else has just grabbed your phone. Yes, yes. So I've, I've definitely noticed that you are, are uh, increasingly leaning on my recommendations yeah. for this but, kind of stuff. But the funny thing is, the one piece of technology that I recommended to you 
mm-hmm. was these headphones. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I take, I know you use them and I take some pride in that. that you yes, know, you, I love them. Yeah. And so the great irony was then I then forgot my headphones going on this trip. Mm-hmm. And it was like a long trip and it was four flights and um, I had lots of things I wanted to listen to. And obviously airline headphones are unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did, I did text you and you kind of, counseled me through the, the pros and cons of of purchasing another pair yeah okay well let's let's let's, let's clarify the situation here for people right uh so we're not like you're, you what you're talking about i don't do you know the name of them they're, they're bose noise cancelling headphones yeah they're, right? really, they're really good they're um yeah they're they're basically they're a pro level headphone um they're they're active noise cancelling they're just very very good at isolating noise uh and for doing audio editing and video editing. They're basically a requirement once you've ever tried them. You realize, how, how did I ever get work done before this? Yeah. Uh, and so you were going to go, you had, you'd had lost them, or I can't remember what the details I, were. No, but... I just forgot them. I just left them at home, and I, I was, I'd driven to the oh, but, airport. Oh, but, okay, so you were already at the airport. I was already at the airport. I couldn't right. go back and get them because I was like, you know, two, four, it would be four hours. I would miss my flight. Yes. So I had forgotten them. I had to do four flights. All of the, this was to <sighs> Vietnam, so it was four flights, very long. Yes, I had. I did have some work I wanted to do, some podcasts I wanted yes. to listen to, and yes. I didn't. And I had this quandary of, you know, do yeah. I, do I get another pair? So okay. I, I, yeah. So 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 you were at the airport, and yeah. from from my perspective, you knew what the right decision was. The right decision is I'm going to be stepping onto an airplane, in which I have no control over my environment. It's going to be very uncomfortable for a long period of time. And I need to get a bunch of work done on these flights. Should I purchase this pair of headphones that will allow me to have a little bit of more comfort and to get more work done? And obviously the answer was yes, right? Yes, you should purchase these headphones again at the airport uh, because when you are on the plane, there's just there's always going to be horrors on an airplane, right? That that you just can do nothing about, right? There's screaming babies, right? Or there's just people who talk loud, or there, there's all kinds of just stuff that can distract you in this terrible and, way. And these headphones do just take that all away. Really yes. Great, yeah. And and the only thing that you can do to protect yourself is to have a, a set of noise canceling headphones, and especially if you need to get some work done. Uh, it would totally make sense to buy them. But you were hemming and hawing, for from my perspective. Just no apparent reason. It was the clear decision to do, and you contacted me because you knew that I would bully you into buying the headphones so that you could get your work done and have a slightly more comfortable flight, which I believe you did in the end. Is that correct? Yeah, and I could, like, blame you as well. Like. That's right. See, this is also it. Yes, you can blame me for making you buy the headphones, even though it was obviously the right choice. I'll, pro- I'll probably text you from the airport tomorrow and say, Gray, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> you've forgotten your headphones again. Yeah, <laughs> <All right. laughs> I was just, I'm just, I was just. You, you made me pull up. I'm looking over. I'm looking over my own pre-flight checklist, and it is, Ooh. it is enormous. Will you give um, us just a little taste? Uh, okay, so I ha- it's broken into two sections, which is the pre-travel, uh, and then the 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 packing. So there's like a bunch of stuff you need to get ready before you can pack, in a sense. Uh, and so I have a list of all the things that needed to need to be charged. Um, I have a note to make sure that I have downloaded and updated all my podcasts, printing backup information for flights and hotels, uh, check into the flight online. Oh, this one you like empty my wallet. So I go through my wallet and, and take out all the cards and things that I can't possibly need wherever I'm going to, because I want my wallet to have the least number of things possible in it. So I have these kind of crazy ones, uh, that often just I don't have to check, but I just want it. I want it there so I see it. So one of them is uh, find out the emergency phone number in the country that you're going to, just to sort of have that uh, on the top of mind in case I need to make an emergency phone call for some reason. Uh, I need to double check my travel insurance, uh, and then we get into the packing section. So I have this long list. Do you realize how much you're filling me with more panic now? No, no, it's, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I hadn't thought of any of these things. All right, so here we go. All right, so I have I have uh, packed the GoPro. You know that little that little camera. Um, yeah. I have you know socks and underwear. I have the Kindle. I have glasses, clothes, sunglasses, toiletries, U.S. passport, Irish passport, laptop, power converters, uh, iPhone, <laughs> iPad, wires. Uh, oh, oh God, the thing that I hate the most: HSBC 
bank dongle. I don't know if you have one of these things, but like this little nah. this this little key thing that you need to punch a number in to log into your HSBC bank. I hate that thing so much. I have um, literally taken that around the world actually, yeah, because I, should, it's... I do have one of them. I, should, I need to take it with me. There you go. Okay, throw that in your bag right now. <laughs> yeah. um, I should be writing this down. Yeah, I have got eye shades. I have my uh, EU health card in case I'm traveling to the EU. Fitbit. Oh, here we go. Pack noise canceling headphones. That's the Bo- uh, Bose headphones. Yeah. Uh, wireless headphones. Oh, and I'll tell you, this is the best one for the United States. Pack a physical pen for customs. Because if you're going to the US, there's when you get into America, there's always a section where you have to fill out this little custom card. And nobody has physical pens with them. And there are never enough at the airport. And you can save yourself like an hour just by packing a pen and to be ready to fill out this stupid piece of paper you need to fill out when you go to the United States. Yeah. Um, so that, that's part of my checklist and all, all of the things that I try to think of for every possible occasion when uh, when traveling. Were you a Boy Scout? I was not. No. Uh, well, I was very briefly in the Boy Scouts when I was very young and hated it and left as fast as I possibly could. All right. <laughs> so it's not always be prepared. I do like to always be prepared, but that conflicts with my dislike of nature, which Boy Scouts obviously involves a lot of. So Oh, and nature is just like physical objects everywhere. It's so untidy, nature. So, so. I mean, I remember we went for a walk around like a forest in um, California, didn't we, with some of the some of the gang. Mm-hmm. Were you just hating that weed? Was that like a really... No, 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 that's, that's different, right? Because those kinds of things are basically nature as theme park from my perspective. <laughs> Right. Oh, we're gonna. There's like a little path. We're gonna walk around, and it's it's sort of a nice. It's a nice change. Uh, that's enjoyable. But nature as oh, like just recreation or camping, or I'm going to put myself through this physically uncomfortable process of you know spending a night a night outdoors. You know, like it's the Neolithic age. Um, I'm not gonna do that. Not voluntarily. I understand people enjoy that. That's great for them. Uh, but I am a big fan of technology. And the indoors, indoors is very nice. Um, so uh, 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 Boy Scouts was not for me. So, like, I went to this toilet in Nepal. <laughs> which okay. Was like, which was uh-huh. like, uh-huh. it was like a hole in the ground in a little shed. Mm-hmm. And it was like very smelly mm-hmm. and very, very unpleasant. Mm-hmm. And but also this little toilet shed had a dual purpose. It was also where they like dried their yak dung. So all, all three walls, you know, other than where the door was, was like from seal, from ground to ceiling, yak dung just mm-hmm. piled, just, you know, pats piled on top of each other. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing you wouldn't have liked that toilet. I, I would not have, a, I would not have appreciated that toilet now. Um, but uh, I'm also like because I, I know who I am. I I, I I would try to avoid putting myself in that kind of travel situation in the first place. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I bet you love. I bet that's one of the things you love about Japan too. They have the best toilets. <laughs> they do. They're amazing. They do. That they was one hundred percent true. It's like being at the controls of the space shuttle when you go to the toilet in Japan. Like they have those like consoles with buttons and you yeah. know. Well. While we're on this topic, because I can't imagine that Japan is going to come up uh, very frequently in the podcast, but I will just mention there are many things that I like about Japan. I love that everything is just super neat and tidy, right? So so just like any store everywhere you go, like everything is tiny boxes. Uh, it is all very neat and clean, and I like that. Uh, and I have to say, I adore and love the Japanese people for their custom of the face mask when they are sick. It's like if, oh, God, if I could make that a cultural thing in the world, I would so do that. Like I deeply appreciate everyone who wears a face mask when they are sick. Uh, I just I think that is that is so the greatest. All, so they're all they're sick when they're doing that. Yes. I, I often see people like on planes and that with masks. And I always like I always think they're trying to avoid getting sick from me. And I always like take offense to it. They're doing that for me, are they? <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're doing that for your benefit. If you are if you are sick, you wear a face mask. Uh, and that is obviously the way that it should be done. Uh, and, every, every, you know, not, you know, London's a very cosmopolitan place. Every once in a while, I will see some some Japanese people who have a face mask on. Uh, and it's like, oh, God, I am so thankful for you to you for wearing that face mask. Obviously, this is what everybody should do. 
Uh, but it is not what everybody does. And then you're in underground and, and there's just, oh, God. I mean, you just think about all the surfaces that you have to touch and all the people who have touched them and how many of them have been sick. And there's sneezing and coughing. And it's just it's amazing that people can not be sick all the time considering how many other human beings you are exposed to. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, that's just a side note. Japan, thumbs up for me for the face masks. Well done, guys. I really love it. I'll give you my thumbs up for Japan. Yeah. I, we go to this music festival there called Fuji Rock, um, which is, you know, a music festival outdoors and you can camp or you can't stay in hotels or you can camp. Anyway, I won't bore you with the details of the festival, mm-hmm. but I don't know what you know of music festivals. but Almost nothing. In the UK, music festivals are almost as famous for their lawlessness and unsanitary conditions as they are for the music. Like things mm. like Glastonbury are famously the toilets are terrible and um, lovely. You know, it. I don't imagine it would be an experience you would find pleasant. So anyway, we went to this, we go to this music festival in Japan, and it's the exact opposite. It's like it's been completely Japaneseized, and it's just everyone is so good and like <laughs> and like um people will put out like a picnic rug getting ready for the music and like mm-hmm. put their valuables on it and then just go decide they want to go and get a drink or something and just leave their stuff mm-hmm. and like people won't steal it and or walk on it it'll just be left there I, that's amazing one, i at one point i uh, lost my a camera i left my camera in a toilet funnily enough the toilets are also lovely there mm-hmm. uh, i left my camera in a toilet someone found it handed it in i got my camera back later they queue they will line up at the recycling bins to make sure they put the right rubbish in the right recycle i saw this this line going what are those people lining up for what's at the end and that was the bottle line and someone else was lining up in the and they will make sure they put everything in the right bins that's amazing it's crazy they're like they do things right there. You would love it. I mean, you, yeah, you do love it. But you would. You would, this is if you were going to go to a music festival. This is probably the only one I imagine you could be dragged along to. That sounds about right. Yeah. So, music festivals in Japan, I guess maybe I will go to. Everywhere else, no, thank you. It looks terrible. Let me tell you one other observation about this music festival, which mm-hmm. I think will lead on to the topic that we were thinking of discussing today. Mm-hmm. Because another thing. I was talking to an English guy who uh, runs, was involved with running this festival. The guy's name's actually Johnny Fingers. He was in the Boomtown Rats for people who are into really old music, but that's by the by. And I was talking to him about it and saying, why do, you know, why do the people like coming to this festival? Mm-hmm. And he said one of the things the Japanese people really liked about this festival was a deliberate decision they'd made to not plaster advertising everywhere. Hmm. It's like set on this mountainside, trees, and it's it's a very beautiful place. And they've kept it looking very natural, whereas most places you go in Japan, obviously, you know, you have your lights and your signs and screens and you can't, you can't move your eyes anywhere without being completely bombarded by advertising. Mm-hmm. And he said, for them, it's a really strange and enjoyable experience to be able mm-hmm. to go somewhere for two or three days mm-hmm. and not see advertising absolutely everywhere. So speaking of seeing advertising absolutely everywhere. Yeah, so that's that's, a, that's one of the things we were thinking about uh, talking about today is the advertising industry. The, I think this is, this is a, a very difficult topic to talk about. When is it okay? When is it not okay? Ad blockers, like there's this whole world of things related to the advertising world. There's some topics in life where I think it is almost impossible to have some kind of consistent opinion that you also always follow through on. And I think advertising is is one of those kinds of things. Mm. Uh, no matter what your thoughts are on advertising, no matter how much you, you think it through, there's always going to be some point where you're acting in a way that is like hypocritical to what you might think if you if you wrote it down on a piece of paper and said this is the way stuff should be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just I have a whole bunch of notes. I'm I'm not exactly sure where to start, but I, I just I think that that's like the opener. There is, I am yeah. probably going to say things that are inconsistent with things that I say later, and I, I think that that is just part of the complication of advertising. And I think that that is also uh, why it's an interesting topic is there there are many different layers uh, to this. So, I mean, are you you thinking about advertising sort of in in the context closest to home for us, presumably, like on kind of YouTube videos and things like that? Yeah. So that's that's kind of the place to start is that both of us have 
our incomes uh, dependent on advertising. Advertising, if you go to watch one of my videos, there's uh, advertising on it. If you go to watch one of your videos, there's advertising on it. Through various means, sometimes if people click, sometimes even if they don't, we earn like a commission from that advertising being displayed. Uh, and so like that is that is the core of how we can make our livings and how many YouTubers make their livings um, is is through that. Maybe the place to start is is the 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 most contentious on the internet is the role of ad blocking software. Yeah. Um, which I, I was going back and forth today about whether or not we should even talk about this topic again because it's it's hard to discuss, uh, especially when your living depends on advertising. Yeah. Um, but ad blocking software exists, and you can you can find many people saying very many different things about it, uh, and it is it's just tricky. And but before I say anything, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have any initial thoughts about ad blocking software? Do you know what? It's something I never really think about. It really, doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't. No, I never think about it. And in fact, one of the first times I have ever. Th- I mean, I'm aware of it, of course, and, mm-hmm. you know, I see comments about it and I'll see a comment on my video where someone will say, oh, these ads are a pain in the backside and someone mm-hmm. else will say, oh, mm-hmm. why don't you use Adblock Pro 3000 and stuff like that. Yeah, there's so many of them. Yeah, and I just kind of let that wash over me. Um, mm-hmm. But the other day I was talking to someone about, my, he was a big YouTube watcher mm-hmm. and I was telling him about the fact I make videos and he did say to me, how do you feel about ad blocking software? I use it. What do you think about that? Mm-hmm. And it was the first time someone had asked me specifically. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's kind of – I take a bit of a don't ask, don't tell. I, don't <laughs> I, I just kind of like – yes, it undermines a source of income for us. It mm-hmm. infringes upon our uh, – Well, this is why it's a good follow-up, <laughs> right? It's, it's, yeah. it's related to the infringement thing. Yeah, these uh, are these people freebooters. I don't know. We'll have to decide. <laughs> but anyway, um, mm-hmm. I guess naively, I don't think much about it. And I should point out that you know, advertising isn't isn't com- the complete is the be all and end all for me for right, right. my business model, and likewise for you now, obviously with other things coming coming yeah. on stream. Sub and and with subable as well. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not the end all be all, but um, yeah. it, it's yeah. definitely. For me, anyway, yeah. I can say that advertising yeah. is the majority of my income. Yeah, and it's very, and it's very important, and it's and it's very important for other people too. So, and it sustains. You know, it helps the creators get paid. There's, you know, for most of the time, there aren't other ways they can be sustained. So, I guess my position should be that I wish people wouldn't block the ads. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess that's just my that's my default position. But I don't feel any fire and brimstone about it. I guess mm-hmm. I, I don't know how prevalent it is for a start. Yeah, I was I was I was googling around earlier today trying to find some numbers for you know what how many people actually use ad blocking software, uh, and, and I could not find anything reliable. But I would say all the numbers were somewhere between five percent at a kind of minimum, and and uh, I saw a couple of very high numbers, but none of them were over thirty percent at a maximum. Wow, uh, that's much higher than I would have thought. But I guess. But who knows? Uh, this is it. Like I don't know. And and the numbers that were saying thirty percent were coming from uh, ad blocking software themselves. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, I don't know if it's if it's in their interest to overinflate those numbers or what. But um, I guess our core audience too are people who watch a lot of YouTube videos, and therefore they're likely to more likely to have it than someone who just occasionally watches yeah. a video to get a recipe. Yeah. And, and so I think right, here, here's here's where the, the complication comes in for me. Sitting down, just thinking about a situation, it's obvious that ad blocking software uh, in aggregate is not good for the internet. I, I think there's there's no argument against that because there are so many things that rely on advertising to be made. Uh, and you know, I often see people say, "Ooh, you know, whatever it is, should use some kind of alternative funding method. You know, you should sell stuff." Or, or sure, there are other ways to to uh, do business, but that doesn't change the fact that that lots of things on the internet just couldn't exist without advertising in their in their current form. Yes. Uh, or the very people who say, you know, you should have a different business model would like it way less if every video site on the internet suddenly charged membership fees 
and there was just nowhere to watch videos for free. Yeah. Uh, right. That that is obviously worse for everybody, and and like my own videos, I like lots of people to see my videos, and the only way that that can work, where I can have lots of people see them and be able to support myself, is to have ads on them. There just there isn't any other way that that can really yeah. work on such a large scale. So it is it is undeniable that in aggregate, ad blocking software is bad for the internet. The, the problem is, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name for it, but it's like there's an economic name for this, but the impact of ad blocking software on any one individual's computer is not, is not going to break anything. Hmm. And, and that is always the fundamental conflict is that for any one person, they can say, well, it doesn't make a difference to creator X if I have ad blocking software, if I don't. And that is true, but but as the number of people who say that increases, it does start to become a problem in aggregate. Of course, uh, and that is where the fundamental conflict comes in. And I, I was trying to think think through some of uh, some of my thoughts on this a little bit earlier. And so while I can say that you know shouldn't have ad blocking software, advertising is what is supporting a lot of things that I love on the internet. Something that kept popping into my mind is is a comparison with fast forwarding the commercials on TV. Yeah. Or if people have uh, like a like a TiVo now, fast forward through the commercials. I think that the TiVos even have like a commercial skip button. Apparently, I'm not exactly sure how that works. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we deliberately like if there's a TV show we want to watch, we'll deliberately go for a cup of tea or some food first so that we mm-hmm. can build up a bit of buffer so that we can fast forward the ads. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, so you, yeah, you yeah. just you can uh, zip through them. So. Yeah. So here's the thing. While I can feel that very passionately about the internet, and I like I totally love the internet, and I think ad blocking software in aggregate is bad for the internet, I would never even like hesitate or think twice to fast forward through TV commercials. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, right. I mean, it wouldn't. It would not even. It wouldn't even cause a, a nanosecond's worth of hesitation in my mind. Like, well, obviously, I'm just going to fast forward these commercials. But the same exact arguments apply, right? That. <laughs> Those TV shows are there because advertisements have are are what's supporting them, yeah. Uh, and so that's why I mean it's just, it's impossible to just not be a total hypocrite in some way with regard to the advertising industry. I mean, the um, only difference is, um, you know, we are we are very exactingly measured on whether or not people watch the ads, whereas no one knows who's fast forwarding, and and the TV companies are kind of a bit, uh, you know, they have just have to guess as to who's watching. In terms of that fast forwarding scenario, as far as I know, I don't think they can measure who fast forwarded through the ads. Um, yeah, uh, so, yeah. So, so me fast forwarding through the ads when I watch um, a TV show is is not is it different? It seems different to me. Like I understand, I understand the in principle it's the same, but it's not quite such a direct hit. So I would argue that that it is is absolutely no different at all, though. Like okay. you, you you want it to be different. Yeah. You think, oh well, they don't. They don't know. They're just paying for a certain amount of advertising. But the the fundamental argument still applies that advertisers are trying to figure out whether it is cost effective to advertise on certain mediums. Yeah. Right. And in some sense, from the the advertiser's perspective, they just care if an advertising campaign is profitable. Yes. And and, and the rest of it can be a bit of a black box from their perspective. So. People who are some some portion of the population blocking ads and some portion of the population fast forwarding that is built into what's called like a like a return on investment calculation uh, that the advertisers have to do. Is it worth buying more advertising in this particular medium, uh, or is it not? Yeah. So that's why it's like I I was doing the same thing earlier when I was thinking about it. like I'm trying to yeah, find yeah. a way the TV is different, but it just isn't. I understand. Um, I mean, so you're saying by me fast forwarding the ads through Downton Abbey. I'm not allowing myself to be influenced and then maybe go out and buy that can of Coke afterwards and that all gets factored in and how many cans of Coke they sell that year gets factored into some big equation algorithm. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. And and so you're, you're skipping the ads as sort of making Downton Abbey less profitable per view uh, from, the, from the producer's perspective and from the yes. advertiser's perspective as well. Yes, because even though um, I think I'm immune to advertising, I'm not. Right. So, yeah, that, yeah, that's one of the things that drives me absolutely crazy. When I because this argument comes up on the internet all the time over over 
advertising. And the thing that drives me crazy is the people who on the internet say like, oh, I never click an ad. And so uh, it doesn't matter if I run ad blocking software anyway. It's like, well, that's not how a lot of the advertisements work. Uh, you know, like yeah. on on YouTube, again, I have to be vague for some reasons, but uh, sometimes you get paid because someone clicks, but, but many times you don't. A person doesn't have to click at all. Uh, an advertisement is just based on the impression. Yeah. Uh, and so... It doesn't even matter that people who say that they never click and buy something. That's that is not how all of the ads work. That's exactly. how many of them work, but not all of them. Yes. Um, so, yeah, it's just it is a it's a very complicated issue, and and I hate stuff like this where I can't I can't come to a a, a perfectly consistent opinion a, a, about you know what should be or how things should work. Um, Do you use ad blocking software? Right. So that is the question, isn't it? Right. Do I have ad blocker installed on my own computer? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that I do. No. Right? I do. <laughs> now. You're depriving me. Oh, you, never watch, <laughs> you never watch my videos anyway. Yeah. Um, so there's there's some qualifications to this. Okay. All right. The first of all is that I'm, I'm very aggressive with what's, uh, what's called a whitelist. Uh, so you can select websites where you will allow the ads to display. And so I do have that set for YouTube, and I have that set for a bunch of websites that I regularly visit um, because I, I don't want to deprive them of impression-based advertising revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is weird because that, that same argument that I, I made before is that I, I also know, and again, I, I, you know, I can't speak to specifics because of the, the sort of contracts we sign with YouTube, but like I know that my individual unblocking of websites makes a negligible difference in their actual revenue. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's weird because... It's like voting, though, isn't it? Like one vote doesn't change an election, but if everyone didn't vote, then... Man, that is a really good comparison. Hmm. That is a really good comparison. Uh, and so, so yeah, it, it, this is where the conflict comes from. Is It's like... It's a symbolic gesture almost in both ways, right, mm. to, to whitelist or to ad block um, because there are the, – there's there's one site in particular that I'm kind of happy to do the ad block on uh, and and uh, it's because like I do not want to give them revenue but it is impossible to avoid them sometimes. And so like I don't want my accidental clicks, uh, you know, to, to give this place any revenue. Um, You're not naming this for a reason presumably. <laughs> I'm going to say imager because that's how I say it in my mind. I don't think that's really how it's pronounced. Okay. But it's I-M-G-U-R. Yeah. And I'm probably going to make a lot of Reddit people very angry when I say this. Um, but I am not a fan of, of imager. imager. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't been since the beginning because I think its whole existence is predicated on just massive copyright infringement. Right? Like, that is basically what the website is. It's a place for people to to host. Um, it's a place where people freeboot. <laughs> yes, it's freebooters well, everywhere. Well, no, okay. The, I, I would, the the users are not freebooters. Okay, <laughs> the users are not freebooters, but the website as a whole is. I'm so and, happy to hear you saying freebooters now. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so, like, one of the places that it really gets me on Reddit is people will host. Um, people will find like some web comic that they think is really funny. And they upload it to Imager and then submit it to Reddit because you know, Imager loads very quickly. Mm. Uh, and so, like, well, what has happened here is that you've now directed Reddit traffic to an image that does not belong to Imager, but Imager is getting all the money from it. They, you know, they are getting the advertising revenue uh, from people looking at this webcomic. And the original webcomic artist is not getting any revenue from that at all. And, and still you won't call it stealing. Ugh. <laughs> yes, because well, again, it is different. It is not stealing, um, but but it 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 really bothers me. I mean, yeah. I under I understand the need for a site like Imager to some extent, you know, and there are historical reasons why image hosting sites exist, which I think are are less of a modern problem. But it used to be that you know you could just assume that anybody's website would just completely crash when a place like Reddit linked to it, yeah, uh, and so nobody would be able to see the thing in the first place, which is why sites like Imager came into existence. Uh, but I, I find that that is less and less the case. Um, websites crashing under the pressure. So there's historical reasons why this thing kind of exists. But I do not whitelist Imager 
um, because it's like I I don't like the existence of your site. I wish that people would link to the actual webcomic or the actual uh, photographer who took this picture and not just put everything up on this gallery. Yeah. Uh, so I have I have conflicted feelings about Imager, but it's hugely popular with the Reddit people. So I imagine lots of are going to be angry about. <laughs> angry about my dislike of it, but I, I don't. Uh, but if you use Reddit, it is just impossible to avoid immature. Yeah, well, you um, make a good case for it. So they, you might make people angry, but I think I think it's a fair point. Maybe. Um, it is legal. Like, there's nothing illegal about ad blocking software, is there? It's, you know. Okay, so, so yeah, here's here's where I think the, the like, a really interesting question about ad blocking software is, um, is that there's an implicit agreement with websites like YouTube and, and, and uh, anything that makes content available for free, that the price of admission is those ads, uh, right? That's, that is basically how you are paying uh, for admission to this website in a way. Um, but what I find very interesting is that there's, there's a lot of question about how or what are the rights that a computer user has to control the software that runs on their machine. Uh, and and that's where I think that ad blocking software is very interesting, mm. um, because I, I'm a I'm a very much absolutist over this. I, I think that general purpose computers, which are laptops, meaning they can are they can run any computer code that you give them. Um, I think that the end users should have extreme control over their own machine. And that, that means that I, I could not imagine any kind of world where um, running ad blocking software could be against the law, for example. Um, or you could try to like sue a particular user for damages for running ad blocking software. Because um, I, I think that you really should be able to have just total control over your machine uh, and the code that is run upon it. But what I, what I wanted to say is I don't know, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of ad blocking companies I can't even remember which one this is from, but but one of them ran a, a fundraising campaign recently, which is which is what has gotten this on my mind for the past couple months, uh, and I've been meaning to write an article about this, but I don't think I ever will. So let's just talk about it now. Um, and I I have very very deep misgivings about a company that exists to create ad blocking software. Um, how do you mean that? I almost feel that the world I would want to live in is one where ad blocking software is not available to the general public. But if you are able to write your own, you can run it on your own machine. So the existing um, ad blocking software, like the one you've got, who, mm-hmm. made, who made that? So it's this, it's this company that ran this, this fundraiser. Uh, oh, you, so I you think bought it's it just, from that company? No, oh, God, no. I would never give them any money. Yeah, so, um, so who did you get yours from? Okay, so this is, this is so the one I'm running is Adblock. It's just called Adblock, I guess. Yeah. Um, there's so many variations of it. I'm not even sure if that's the full name. Uh, but they have, they have this little promo video that I, I recently watched, and it just drives me crazy because it starts off, they're, they're doing a fundraiser, and they say, uh, there's two lines in there, right? Which is like, I love an internet without advertisements, and they're trying to promote. Uh, they're trying to promote this to people. So they've made an ad. <sighs> yeah, they've made an ad about their own ad blocking software, and I guess <sighs> it's like the institutional existence of this ad blocking software. I I don't I don't like because this when you talk about the the place that is making the ad blocking software. I think you can very clearly point at them and say, like, you are making the internet worse in a way that you you can't assign the blame to the individual users because each individual user has a negligible impact. But the, the ad blocking software company themselves, they're the ones that allows this aggregate genuine impact to occur. And so I feel like you can assign blame towards them. Uh, and they is, talk. Is that, like, is that like blaming a gun manufacturer for the bad deeds of people? I, who... Right. This is this, this is exactly it. like it's so conflicting. I don't know if that is it is an appropriate or an inappropriate analogy. It, it it might be a very good one. It might be a very bad one. I can't decide. I can't figure out where I stand on this, and I find it very frustrating. The thing I um, don't understand. Sorry if I've. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Maybe I've kind of missed missed something here. 
this company, like, who's been making ad blocking software before this company? Like, was before that, was it just like a little cottage industry? Or has it always been made by uh, institutional, you know, by organizations? I, I, I'm pretty sure this one started as an individual guy, and now they have a couple of employees. So it used to be like a little un- underground thing, and now it's become like a, yeah, like I, a big I, thing. Yeah, I guess. I guess so. I have to be honest. I don't. I don't know fully the background. And I said there's there's so many of these places as okay. well. Um, so I'm I'm not exactly sure what the situation is. But so one of the things that the that the ad block says in their video is help make the internet a better place. And I, and I think like ad block does the exact opposite. Yeah, they might as well say help make the internet a better place by putting CGP Grey out of business. Yeah, right? Like that that is like help make the internet a better place. And they keep talking about these ads as though there's some kind of natural uh barrier uh, like oh, we would have this really clean path, but there's all these boulders that nature left in the way, right? And help us clear these boulders, you know, and we're going to make this road a better place. Yeah. Right? And like the actual situation is somebody built a toll road and they're saying, help us tear down this toll booth uh, to make the world a better place. And it's like, well, the toll booth is the thing that pays for the upkeep of that road. Uh, yeah. And so like, it, is, it is not a fair comparison. So I don't know. Like I said, I, I, yeah. I feel so uncomfortable even, even talking about the existence of, of ad blocking software. I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite about this. Um, but it's 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 just so it's a it's a tricky contentious issue. I just feel like the the I don't want the company that allows me to do this thing to exist. That is the situation that I would like in the world, which is kind of crazy. Um, but I'm 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 you know, yeah. It's 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 just a very complicated situation. Um, well, I'm happy to say I don't run ad blocking software, but that's mainly because I probably just couldn't get it to work. I can't even get my email to work. <laughs> the city of Sao Paulo a few years ago actually banned advertising in all public places in the city. Mm. Um, so people had to take down uh, public billboards that, that faced, um, faced public streets, I think is the, the way it worked. Um, and there's some interesting pictures. If you go on Flickr, you can find photos of Sao Paulo where there are no advertisements, uh, but there are still the the blank billboards up in various places. Mm. Uh, and, and that's a case where I also think, boy, if I was the, the mayor of the city of London, I would totally do that uh, without, without any hesitation. I would pass that law uh, as well. Because um, I, I think that, that is, that's a situation where clearly not having advertising is, is sort of, it's a nicer experience, or like you're talking about the, the the Japanese going to the music festival before. Mm-hmm. It's a nicer experience to go through a place that does not have advertising, yeah. and unlike much of the internet, the city will still exist without billboards. Uh, if someone took down all the billboards in London tomorrow, those buildings wouldn't go away. All right, they're they're not dependent on the advertising revenue from the billboards to exist. Yeah, but, you know, would, but would the businesses that populate them start having problems and start ha- start going out of business, and it starts this slippery slope of decline? I mean, just like me fast forwarding through the TV. Are you being are you being um, simplistic about it? Is that more important to the economy than you're realizing? I mean, maybe I would. Oh, do you mean just like a big billboard for like McDonald's or something? And it's not not like you know, not like you know, Bill the Jewel are saying, "Come and buy my rings because they're thirty percent off." You're talking about like Coca Cola putting some big billboard up on a. That, yeah, that, that, that's the kind of thing that Sao Paulo was talking about. They okay. they didn't take down uh, like business signs, okay, you yeah. know, like in the business window or, or that kind of stuff. But yeah. they they were just yeah. taking down uh, giant public billboards, which Fair I would enough. suspect. Is a, would be a fairly negligible impact. Um, would you be happy for the city of London to do that and pay double council rates? I would be pretty surprised if it had to double the council rates. <laughs> I was being uh, provocative. <laughs> um, I was saying it's all part of an economy. It is all part of an economy. Yeah. Uh, would I pay double? I don't know. I often I, I wonder about that. I actually I kind of think about this sometimes on the underground. Because uh, there's there's tons of advertising on the underground. Of course, yeah. And I have I have actually wondered a couple of times, 
what increase in underground ticket would I be willing to pay to not have any of this advertising here? Yeah. Uh, because I've seen – Oh, God, I'm going to say the Moscow subway, but this might be totally wrong. Sorry, Internet. I'm not looking it up right now. Um, but I have seen beautiful photos of some subways where their interiors do not have any advertisement. And it's just it's like some big art project or it looks like a beautiful hall. Yeah. And I, I think that that is a genuinely nicer experience for people on public transport to to be able to take out the advertising. Um, but... My understanding – I tried to look into this once a while ago. But my understanding is that the advertising on the London Underground is a very substantial uh, decrease in the cost of the actual ticket. That advertising money is no joke for London. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, it might – you know, whatever their actual number is, if it's like double the, the price, like, oh, God, that's – you know, I'm not sure I would be willing to pay that. And I know there are lots of people who just couldn't pay that. You know, if you double their transportation costs, it's not practical. Yeah, they say that, but they say that, at, they, you know. They're sneaky like that, organisations, aren't they? It's like with petrol. They say, oh, the petrol's so expensive because so much of it's tax or mm-hmm. it's the price of oil and then those other things come down, but mm-hmm. the petrol price doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's – yeah. Uh, anyway. Well, the petrol thing the petrol thing is tricky. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, the, the only other thing that uh, that might be worth just mentioning that I, I sort of alluded to in the beginning, you know, we, we've talked about this being, a, you know, a 10 – episode experiment yeah. uh, from, you know, straight from the beginning and see if we can even get to 10 episodes. Uh, and there are, there are many things that affect whether or not this is going to be a successful experiment. One of them is how many people listen. Another one is how much of a, an impact this has on your work schedule and my work schedule. Um, but it is undeniable that a, a, a big uh, portion of this is also the effectiveness of the advertising on the podcasts. Mm. And so this very thing that we are doing is a is another example of how advertising can bring into existence some things that otherwise would not have happened. Yeah. Uh, and it is is only because I was, you know, I was thinking about doing a podcast and trying to look into some numbers about how it might be financially sustainable. And you know, there is already a pre-existing world of, of podcast advertising. And uh, so that's like this podcast. I don't know if we would have ever started it if uh, if the if the world of podcast advertising did not exist, if I if I couldn't see a way that ooh, maybe if we're going to be doing this as a joint project that's taking up both of our times for, you know, that we could be spending on other things like it also has to it has to be a financially viable product. I tell you what, what the, whoever's whoever's getting these ads done is getting a, whatever they're paying. They're getting a bargain having you do it, Gray, because <laughs> your syrupy voice, you could you could, Why, thank you. you could sell ice to the Eskimos. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm. I'm uh... How do you find doing the ads? Because I mean, you've been talking a lot about advertising, and you know, I've known you for a while now, and I know you're very sensitive about advertising, and your yeah. audience is so important to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, now reading ads, which is a new experience for you. Uh, I know you don't just read them, and you you put a lot of flair to them. But how are you finding doing ads? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe that's part of why this has also been on my mind. Um, you know, it, it's it's been an interesting experience because in on YouTube, I feel very disconnected from the ads that play before the videos. Yeah, and I don't have anything to do with them. They they come through this gigantic auction auction system uh, is the way it works on YouTube, uh, and so I, I feel just totally removed from them. And on my videos, uh, you know, I am very sensitive and have you know turned down offers so far to. Uh, speak an ad at the end of the video because I feel like, ooh, I don't, I don't like this or I haven't quite figured out the way that I want to do it uh, if I were ever to. But I, it's never uh, come up as something that I would like to do in the videos yet. Um, but on the podcast, yeah, it just it seems very natural to do it. And maybe that's, again, just because going back to not, not being able to have a consistent opinion, while I feel very strongly about not speaking in the, the videos and advertisement, in the podcast, it just seems totally natural. And... Maybe that's because I listen to a lot of podcasts, and so I'm very used to this format of uh, the host reading out an advertisement. Mm. Um, that it, it just, yeah, it just it seems very natural, and uh, you know, so far I've been, we've been lucky to have products that I actually use and like and can feel good yeah, recommending. That's good. Um, so that that has been very helpful, but um, yeah, it is it has been less weird than I thought it might be. 
uh, is what I, I would say. I have to say, it's a crazy thing. I'm really, I really love sport. Mm-hmm. And obviously, I, I watch a lot of sport. I'm missing a big football game to be doing this podcast, by the way. Oh, thank you. And um, I, st- I, do, I do still find it crazy because I watch a lot of baseball, how in American commentary they do these, these ad reads. That does still seem... I still have, haven't gotten used to it even after all this time where some guy will be talking about the pitching matchup and then suddenly it'll be, he'll be telling you how great, you know, some hot dog brand is or how, how great some car is. Like you mean the, just, the sports announcer does it? Yeah, like the commentator. Like hmm. he, He'll just say how wonderful something is and then he'll get back on. And I still find it weird in sports commentary, but that's because they don't do it in other countries um, or they don't do it in the UK in that way. Hmm. But you're right, in podcasts, I mean, I've been listening to a lot as well now, just, you know. It just seems like a thing they do, you know? Yeah, it, it seems very natural. And, you know, again, with conflicts over advertising, I have genuinely benefited from signing up to a bunch of the services that I have heard on podcasts. Yeah. Uh, you know, so um, while, while we're recording this today, I have I have no idea who the advertiser is going to be because I'm going to be recording that in the future. So what I'm about to say is not an advertisement. It's just, it's just me saying it. But, like, I found out about Squarespace from... Uh, listening to podcast ads on the 5x5 network, which was uh, home to a bunch of the shows that I listened to. And, mm. like, that that was great. Like, that is an example of where uh, my life is genuinely easier and better from uh, advertising. And so, like, you can't just say, like, oh, it is always an interruption uh, because I don't know how else I would have found out about something like that. Like, I'm not, I'm not deeply involved in the website building world you know that's like that's tangential to what i'm actually trying to do uh yeah. and so i'm not sure something like that would have ever come to me through just word of mouth it can it can be beneficial i mean granted the the number of of products that are like that in my life is very small when compared to the total number of advertisements i have ever heard <laughs> yeah. right which is like functionally infinite yeah. um but it, it, that's still that has still been the case for me um yeah I think that's yeah, that's a forgotten thing about ads, isn't it? Sometimes they actually are doing are performing a service. They, mm-hmm. have, they have a utility as well, but yeah, they do. Yeah, cool, mate. <sighs> I th- you know what? I think there's a lot more to say about advertising, and like we've come at it from this angle of of ad blocking, and and you know, um, but there are other aspects to advertising to do with being a YouTuber that we haven't even talked about. So I suspect maybe. Maybe we'll yeah. be talking about this again sometime. It might come up. Maybe maybe in the follow-up. I don't know. I feel exhausted and I feel I feel weird even just talking about this topic. Um but yeah, I figure we will cut it there because we've been talking for a while. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, uh, I've got, and I've, you need you I've need to pack. pack. I've yeah, pack. that's right. <laughs> I've got to watch football. I've got to pack. I'll probably make a number file video. Yes. <laughs> email me that checklist. Yes, I, I will email you the checklist uh so that you can probably just mostly ignore it tomorrow. As you run around in a frenzy of last-minute packing. I would not forget my headphones.